Luke 2, 8 through 14. The King James text today reads, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Amen. Father, today, God, once again, we thank you, Lord, for this time, for this season. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to reflect upon and remember that moment in human history when divinity and humanity met in that manger in Bethlehem. Master, as the word of God would go forth today, no one stands more aware of his human frailty and the need for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. No one understands the need for this more than I do. And I ask God today that your anointing, your power, your presence would rest upon me as your messenger. Help me, O oh God, to deliver the word of the Lord in a fashion that is pleasing in your sight and in a fashion, O oh God, that, uh, that causes it not merely to be heard in human hearing, but rather, O oh God, so that it might bring about change in human hearts. Touch us today, O oh God, by reason of your word, for we ask it in that precious name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian family on my mother's side. They were all assemblies of God, and uh, I grew up in the uh, in the in the the. the muck and mire of a movement that seems to believe that fear is the most powerful tool God can possibly use. I grew up in a church listening to preaching where the preacher seemed like most of the time anyway, the preacher was more interested in scaring you to death then he was uplifting you and inspiring you and encouraging you to believe and obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this mentality within fundamentalism and evangelicalism that the best way to get people to the foot of the cross is to scare the life out of them. Hmm. you got to scare people to death. We hear more preaching about hell then we do heaven, we hear more preaching about the devil than we do about the Lord. We hear more preaching about the judgment of God than we hear about the mercy of God, the love of God, the grace of God. And it's so sad because when we go back to the very beginning of the gospel story, when we go back to the very start, of that wonderful occasion when God manifested himself to the human family in the person, in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God himself was born into human existence at the very beginning, 
fear was not part of the plan. Fear was not the crux of the message. As a matter of fact, the very opposite was true. Hallelujah. The angel of God appeared to the shepherds in the field. And of course, any time the glory of God is revealed, people tend to get scared. You let the glory of God be revealed and folks begin to quake and shake. It's a little scary. Well, I got news for you. The word of God tells us that the glory of God is seen. Listen, this is what the apostle told us. In the face of Jesus Christ. You want to see the glory of God? Hallelujah. Look Jesus in the face. When those angels, when that angel appeared to the shepherds in the field, he was bringing news to them of the revelation of the glory of God on planet earth. And of course their reaction, as so often is the case, with anything concerning God, you start talking about God and how many people immediately go to a fear response. You start talking about God and people who really believe and understand there is a God, immediately they go to, oh boy, judgment. Oh boy, yeah, condemnation. Oh boy, yes, because that is the concept and the understanding of God that they have. I've got news for you today. The Old Testament message of the law didn't do a whole lot to inspire the notion of God that is gracious and merciful and kind. No, the law was given not to reveal God to humanity. Listen, this is what the Word of God tells us. The law was given to reveal sin. Mm -hmm. The law was not there so we could understand God. The law was there so we could understand sin. The Word of God said where there is no law, there is no sin. There is no transgression where there is no law. You cannot transgress something that does not exist. If there's no speed limit on this road, then you cannot break the speed limit. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? In order to break the speed limit, there has to be an established legal speed limit. And that speed limit has to be posted. Am I telling the truth now? Uh, yep. Well, that was the nature of the law. So the law created in many people fear and therefore anything that came from God immediately was to be feared. And yet interestingly enough at the very beginning of the Lord Jesus Christ's life the angel of God appeared to the shepherds. And the first words off his lips were, Fear not! Hallelujah! Now notice, he did not say, Fear not! Because I'm not here to hurt you! Nope. That's not what he said. He said, Fear not! Why am I telling you not to be afraid? For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Hallelujah. He said, don't be afraid. Fear not. Because, honey, I've got good news. Matter of fact, I've got great news. Hallelujah. I bring you good tidings from the beginning, Tommy. The message of Christ was a positive message. Yes. The message of Christ was good tidings. That would bring great joy. Oh my goodness. Would it be great joy for the Jew? Excluding the Gentile. Would it be great joy for the heterosexual? Excluding the homosexual. Would it be great joy for the white man? Or for the bronze skinned man? Excluding those people of color. Or those people from the Far East? No. The angel declared, I bring you good tidings of great joy, 
which shall be to all people. Hallelujah. I tell people all the time, gospel, the word gospel in the Greek literally translates good news. And it is not good news for this group over here and bad news for that group over there. What makes our church different than first church down the road is that the gospel we preach is good news. Whether you're straight or gay, whether you're black or white, whether you're old or young, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're fat or skinny, whether you're ugly or pretty, that's good news to all people. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. Oh my goodness. When you understand the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ, you understand that nowhere in the message of Christ is the message hope for one and condemnation for another. That is not the gospel. That is not the gospel. The gospel is good news. It is Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. You know, the angel using the phraseology, unto you is born this day, is very interesting because... When a baby's born in our world, it is not celebrated as being an addition to the human family. It is celebrated as being an addition to the family of the mother and the father and the grandmother and the grandfather. That baby isn't born unto us, it's born unto them. Am I telling you the truth now? Somebody has a baby, they don't send out a... An announcement that says, hey folks, unto you is born little Johnny or little Billy or little Freddie or little Susie or little Annette. No, and they say, we've had a baby. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. But see, the angel was revealing an eternal truth, a powerful truth, a wonderful truth. In the very beginning of the Lord's life, he was revealing something that was powerful and wonderful. This baby was not born, listen to me children, this baby was not born to Joseph and to Mary. That baby was born unto you. Hallelujah to God. His name shall be called Emmanuel. Which means God with, not with Mary, not with Joseph, not with the Jewish people, but God with us. Hallelujah. God with the human family. The word of God declares in the third chapter of the book of John, the, the writer of John, uh, his account of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the third chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ is quoted as speaking to Nicodemus in the garden at night, having a secret meeting. And immediately after explaining to Nicodemus that one must be born again if they have any hope of making heaven. Immediately after that portion of their conversation, the Lord Jesus Christ began to say more. He said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You see, that baby in the manger was not a gift to Mary. When my mother had me, I was a gift to mom. I was a gift to dad. When your mother had you, you were a gift to mom and dad. But Jesus Christ was not a gift to mom and dad. No, mom was nothing but a tool. She was the avenue, the means by which this gift from God to the world should be made manifest and should be given. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him 
should not perish but have everlasting life. This is Jesus speaking. This is Jesus telling us why he was given to the world. He said, for God sent not his son into the world. When he used that phrase, into the world, notice he did not say unto the world. He did not send his son from heaven to the world. He said God did not send his son into the world. This speaks of a mission. This speaks of uh, one's purpose. He said, God sent not his son into the world. He did not send his son with a mission to do what? To condemn the world. But that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. The angel said in Luke chapter 2, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, not a judge, not a condemner, not a criticizer, a Savior. His mission was not to condemn, but to save. Hallelujah. That's why today we don't have to be afraid. That's why today the angel of God still does declares, fear not. That's why today, as a messenger of the gospel, I say to you, fear not. Hallelujah. There is nothing in the gospel of Jesus Christ that should inspire you to fear. But rather it ought simply to inspire you to believe. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever you know <laughs> I grew up in church and we used to quote that passage of scripture every Sunday practically I mean that was that was a passage you learned in Sunday school when you were knee high to a grasshopper as they say oh man I mean a little kid you ask any little child in a fundamentalist church, in an evangelical church, quote for me John 3, 6, and thing, and I promise you they'll look at you with those big wide eyes and with a smile and confidence they'll say, for, John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life I grew up knowing that passage by heart from my earliest youth and yet it's only been in fairly recent years that I genuinely understood that passage I went through a lot of years believing I was excluded from the church. I was excluded from the kingdom of God. I had no place. God didn't want me. I was innately wicked. I was innately evil. There was something wrong with me because of who I was and what I experienced psychologically and emotionally and sexually and who I was attracted to and all these issues I was convinced excluded me from the kingdom of God and and by extension from heaven and it took many 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 years for God to convince me I said for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, mm -hmm. whosoever is heterosexual, nope. Whosoever is Jewish, nope. Whosoever attendeth an Assemblies of God church, nope. Whosoever joineth the Jehovah's Witnesses, nope. Whosoever is part of the Mormon organization, nope. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting 
life. It took me a long time, booby, to understand that whosoever included me. Hallelujah. You see, whether you're straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind, that does not prevent you from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who you are does not affect your ability to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it does not prevent you from believing, I've got news for you today. Fear not! Because if it can't keep you from believing, it can't keep you from receiving. Hallelujah! If it can't prevent you from believing this gospel, it cannot prevent you from receiving the promise of the gospel which is whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life everlasting life is available to you today if you are able to believe in the name of the only begotten son of the living God hallelujah for unto you is born. You, unto you is born. Uh, uh, the, the shepherds, I didn't have any pregnant wife. I wasn't expecting any babies. But the angel said, unto you is born this day. I got news for you. Luke chapter 2. That angel wasn't just talking to those shepherds. That angel was talking to you and I. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. Not a judge, not a criticizer, not a condemner, but a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Oh my God, this Savior that has been born is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the promised one. He is the one that God said before creation that God promised before creation, before the foundations of the earth had been formed, God had already spoken and said, I will send a Savior. And according to John chapter 1, the Word was with God and the Word was God. Therefore, God must have said, I will send a Savior. Oh, listen to me, children. will be that Savior. Hallelujah to God. God spoke that promise. He promised a Christ. He promised a uniquely anointed one. In the Old Testament prophets, they declared that our God, the God of Israel, would come. He himself would come. The word of God said, and then shall the eyes of the blind be opened. Then shall the deaf, uh, the ear of the deaf be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as in harp. When would those things happen? According to the prophet, when the God of Israel appeared. Oh, hallelujah. Not the second person of the Holy Trinity. When the God of Israel appeared, said, then you'll see these powerful, wonderful things happen. And we know from Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 9 and 6, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. Now God himself declares over and over and over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. He speaks through the psalmist. He speaks through the prophets. He says, I alone am God and beside me there is no other. He declares through the prophet. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So God never created anyone or anything that would be called a God. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? So my Jehovah's Witness friend, you better get your doctrine right. Because God did not create someone who would be called a God. No, 
in Isaiah 9 and 6, Isaiah declared, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the, the, the mighty God, hallelujah, there is but one singular mighty God, and that is Jehovah. That is Adonai. Hallelujah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. And in case there's any confusion as to who that baby in the manger, Christ the Lord, would be, Isaiah said, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. You confused about who Christ the Lord is? <laughs> you see, when those Jewish uh, shepherds heard the angel make this declaration, they understood very clearly that what the angel was saying was that this was the Christ, meaning the anointed one, the promised one, the Messiah that was to come. But then the angel tacked on the Lord. Well, I got news for you. Every time a person of Hebrew heritage prays, they begin their prayer with a passage from Deuteronomy that declares, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It doesn't matter how he reveals himself. It doesn't matter how many times he reveals himself or what he reveals himself as. It is the one and self-same God who is Lord. And there is only one God and there is only one Lord. And the one we call Lord is God and the one we call God is Lord. And the angel said, and unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior which is Christ the Lord. Hallelujah. Whew. The word of God told us in prophetic fashion that when Jesus came, said his name shall be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Hallelujah. Got news for you. Those shepherds knew what the angel was saying. My Lord have mercy. God has come. Hallelujah. God has come. He promised he would be our Savior. In the Old Testament prophets, the, the Lord declared, I am the Lord, that is my name. And beside me there is no other. I am the Lord, that is my name. And beside me, listen, he said, beside me, there is no Savior. The only Savior that God said he would ever send to the nation of Israel or through the nation of Israel was himself. I love that passage that David the psalmist wrote when he said, The Lord hath sworn unto his servant David. And he will not turn from it. <laughs> Say, God made a promise to me and he will not back away from it. Of the fruit of thy loins shall I sit upon thy throne. God told David, David, through your heritage, through your bloodline, I am going to come and I am going to sit upon your throne. That is why the angel of God declared, For unto you is born this day where? In the city of David. <laughs> A Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Oh, my great God in heaven, children today fear not. There is nothing in this gospel that you need be fearful of. The glory of God is revealed to humanity in the person and in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is nothing to be feared in this. 
The Word of God tells us also at the beginning of this gospel story in Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Joseph was contemplating putting Mary away and doing it quietly as she was now found to be with child and she was making this harebrained claim that she had been impregnated by nothing more and nothing less than the Spirit of Almighty God. That a child had been placed in her womb by the Spirit of Almighty God overshadowing her. And the Word of God declares, Matthew 1.20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. My, that angel was busy around the time Jesus was born, wasn't he? The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, listen, fear not <laughs> to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. I've got news for you. There is nothing about this gospel that was ever designed to inspire fear. Even when God does what is otherwise thought to be impossible, the Spirit of the Lord speaks through His messenger and says, Don't be afraid. In this process of my revealing myself to the human family, in this process of my incarnation, there is nothing to fear. I tell Joseph, Fear not. Hallelujah. I told the shepherds, fear not. Oh, I'm telling you today, fear not. In Luke chapter 1, verse 13, Zacharias, who is the father soon to be of the great prophet and forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, Listen, he gets a visitation by the angel of God. And the word of God said, Matthew 1, 20, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto... Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, Luke 1, 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not! <laughs> Hallelujah! Every step... Everything God did at the beginning of this gospel, every step of the way, every part of that journey began with the words, fear not. So why do we shake and quake and fear at the mention of the name Jesus? Why are we afraid when we think of God and when we are brought into remembrance this great gospel? But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Hallelujah. Whew. We've got three accounts at the beginning of this gospel. Three accounts that all begin with the words, Fear not. Something incredible is happening. Something marvelous is occurring. Something supernatural is taking place. But don't be afraid. Hallelujah. Hmm. And it doesn't end there. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. Mary is visited by the angel of the Lord. She's engaged to be married. She's a young girl. The most life-changing event that would ever take place in the life of any young Jewish girl is about to take place. And the angel of the Lord, listen, in Luke chapter 1 verse 30, and the angel of the Lord said unto her, Fear not! Mary, for thou hast found favor 
with God. <laughs> Don't be afraid, Mary. You're about to be thrust into a life circumstance that is going to make your life difficult. Every day of your life, people will question your morality, your decency, your faith, your walk with God. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you, but for this LGBT believer, every day of my life, somebody runs around questioning my morality. Somebody runs around questioning my faith. Somebody runs around questioning my walk with God. Because after all, it's not possible. It wasn't possible that Mary should be found with child either, not having known a man. But she was. Because God was doing something. If you have a problem with me being a Christian, if you have a problem with me serving God, if you have a problem with me being part of the church today, I've got news for you. It's your problem. It's not God's. Hallelujah. Because the Word of God declares, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Jesus said, nothing is impossible. Then he tacked on these two words, only believe. Hallelujah. If you can believe it, you can benefit from it. He said, let me tell you something. This gospel started with the words, Fear not. Hallelujah. It started when I sent my angel to have a discussion with Mary with the words, fear not. It started when I sent my angel to Joseph in the night uh, through a dream. And it started with the words, fear not. It started when I spoke to the father of John the Baptist, who in his old age would finally experience the birth of a son, something he had given up all hope concerning. And it started with the angel speaking the words, Fear not. And when I first opened my eyes, that is a newborn infant, still covered in afterbirth. <laughs> Surrounded by hay. Surrounded by the breath of animals and the stench of dung. Not born into a castle, not born into the home of a king or a pharaoh, but born in a manger in the most humble environment that anyone could ever imagine one being born. I'll tell you, if this story were made up, very few people make up stories with such odd circumstances. If somebody just sat one day and decided to write the gospel of Jesus Christ, they probably would have had him born into a king's home. They probably would have had him born a prince. They probably would have had him born into wealth, am I telling the truth, or born into privilege. But that is not the case. The story of the gospel of Jesus Christ is so full of contradiction uh, in terms of how the human mind would perceive that such a thing should transpire. God did everything exactly opposite the way we would think that it should happen. Am I telling the truth? I mean, after all, if God's going to be born into humanity, then surely he'd be born to the richest among us. Surely he'd be born into the most powerful family. Surely he'd be born into uh, the greatest kingdom, not the smallest, tiniest kingdom on earth. Israel. And the kingdom on top of everything else that was conquered and under the rule of a foreign leader. No, God has a way of doing things. And His ways, the Word of God says, are past finding out. I'm here to tell you today, children, 
The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news. It is good news. Took me a long time in my life to finally come to realize that gospel genuinely is good news. And it's not good news for some and bad news for others. It's not hope for some and condemnation for others. It is good news for all people. And that includes you. If you're part today of the LGBT community, I want you to understand this gospel is good news for you too. Yes, and because amen. it is good news, I want to tell you as the angel spoke to Mary, as the angel spoke to Joseph, as the angel spoke to Zacharias, as the angel spoke to the shepherds in the field watching over their flocks by night, fear not. There is nothing to fear. It's all good. I'm going to close with this little analogy, and I hope I don't cheapen my message today by doing so. But if an enormous spaceship were suddenly to break through the clouds and appear in the sky, and it was of such a size and magnitude that it could easily be equated with, for instance, the city of New York or the city of Los Angeles. We've all seen movies with these enormous, gigantic spaceships, you know. That ship would probably terrify the flames out of us. Just like when we think of God. We think of how big God is and how awesome God is and how powerful God is and how final and just his judgment will be in the end. It can inspire fear. But then if one little tiny alien were to come down from that ship, now he's not the entire alien race, but he's just a little tiny portion, a little representative and he's no bigger than we are. He's no smaller than we are. But rather, he's very much, you know, on scale with us. If that alien were to appear on planet Earth, and as he appears, the first words off his lips were, Fear not. I've got good news. Hello now. I bring you good tidings of great joy said no I haven't come to destroy I haven't come to judge I haven't come to extinguish I've not come today to do some great terrible thing but I've come to bring you good news I've come to bring you something that is going to make you quite happy all of a sudden that spaceship in the sky wouldn't look so terrifying, would it? Have we seen into the spaceship? Have we seen how many aliens are up there? Have we seen what the capability of that spaceship is to destroy? Have we seen their weapons? Have we seen their capabilities? No, we have not. But we've heard from one small representative of that greater body and that representative said, fear not. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus Christ is that one singular physical representative of God Almighty. That's why he's called the only begotten Son of God. Because God has never before and never will again the Hindus will tell you that their God has manifested himself over and over and over again through the centuries. Uh, that is not in keeping with Christian doctrine. That is not in keeping with our faith today. No, our God has manifested himself once and once only. There is no second manifestation of God in the earth. He is the only begotten 
Son of God. He is the only man ever conceived of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, he is the only man who can genuinely claim God as his Father and can genuinely claim then that he is in fact physically, spiritually, genuinely the Son of Almighty God. He's the only begotten Son of the Father, the Word of God said, full of grace and truth. And I've got news for you this afternoon. The message that he brings to us from the limitless, boundaryless, powerful, omniscient Spirit of Almighty God is this. Fear not. I've not come to destroy. I've not come to judge. I've come to save. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?